Awesome. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Just let everyone load in. <clears throat> Awesome. Well, welcome everybody to our webinar. Welcome to Resilient Coastal Communities in the Face of Climate Change. Just so you all know, this is a recorded event. It is being recorded to post on our website. My name is Larissa Dean, and I'm working with the Nova Scotia Environmental Network this summer as the Communications and Informations Manager. Um, just this year, I graduated from the University of King's College through Dalhousie with a brand new degree in uh, Social and Environmental Sustainability in English. Um, I hope to continue working within the Nova Scotia environmental community, and I'm very thankful for this opportunity today. Um, a little bit about the Nova Scotia Environmental Network, or NSEN. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that strives to support, strengthen, and promote environmental work of our members by connecting them to each other, to governments, and to the general public. We have a membership of 40 environmental organizations whose common purpose is to conserve and enhance the natural environment and overall build a sustainable future for Nova Scotia. As part of our connections we are forging, we host free monthly webinars on a variety of environmental topics and issues. And today we're super excited to be joined by Georgia Klein, who is a faculty member at the College of Sustainability at Dalhousie and teaches a variety of sustainability topics, including coastal adaptation and community management. I've learned lots personally from Georgia and I'm thrilled to have gotten to work with her on this project. Um, Georgia has a presentation for us and we will likely have time for questions and some discussion. Um, and with that, I will pass it off to Georgia to start her lovely presentation. Thank you so much, Larissa, and thank you so much for having me tonight and welcome everybody. Sadly, I can't see the little Hollywood squares and I don't know who's in the room. So welcome to all of you and I hope I can open the grid later maybe for a discussion. I can see your faces. That would be awesome. Um, I would like to start actually with a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that we are here on the territory in Mi'kma'ki, on the territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and that we are all pre pre treaty people. And that's important to me because of the ongoing systemic issues and uh, um, we are hearing about and uh, that are not yet gone away mysteriously, miraculously, and especially for me important um, to listen to what the Pope has to say now that the Pope is visiting Canada that brings up another a level of, uh, of importance, I think, and uh, it's time, a good time for us to engage with that and reflect on that as well. And with that, uh, on further ado, I'm just starting into it. Um, so two little things ahead. I'm trying not to use too much uh, academic lingo. Should I do it though? And there's something I say you don't understand, then please don't be shy to just wave your hands. As I said, I don't see you, but Larissa, you can always interrupt me. This is not just supposed to be a chalk and talk. I would love to hear your voices in between. So interrupt me anytime if you would like to add something or ask a question. Um, I would absolutely welcome that. The other thing is that um, you hear from my accent, I'm obviously not a native speaker. I'm originally from Germany and uh, I always tell my students that if I say something you don't understand because of my accent or I'm using completely wrong word and it's confusing you, also anytime please stop and interrupt me and ask me. I'm never offended about that. Okay, Larissa, can I start? Should I go? Should I go? Should we go? Should we go? Okay, awesome. So a little bit about tonight, what you can expect. A little intro into what we love and what's at stake and why. And then I talk about an overview of coastal armoring and the side effects. You're going to hear something about um, a long needed piece of legislation we can expect and trembling with anticipation. Um, and then I would love to talk about nature-based solutions because we have fantastic solutions for the issues and problems we are facing. And they are out there, they are already applied in fantastic examples of what can be done. 
and how beneficial they are on many multiple different levels, I'm going to explain. And then I talk about a little bit more about how we can increase community resilience, put everything in a nutshell, round it up, and then hopefully, hopefully we'll have a lively discussion after. Okay, let's start. So people and the coast. Um, people love the coast. We love to live on it. We love to play on it. We love to make our money from it. We love to feel spiritually, spiritually and emotionally connected with it. Um, but most of us don't understand its complexity or what it really does for us. And as you can see already from this picture, it was a great idea once upon a time to build your house smack on the ocean because that's what we where we would like to be. And then to protect our property from erosion, we started to build these walls. And that's also called hard armoring uh, to protect our property from erosion. Um, the effects of armoring, I'm going to talk about a little later. But it's just this is I want you to put that a little bit into context with what we really love and how we deal with this, deal with it with what loves, what we love is actually attacking us. And that gives gets me directly to my next topic. Um, we I think personally, I think we need to sort of paradigm shift because we are using military language and terminology when we talk about what is basically something beautiful, but we turn it into a language of war against the elements. We're talking about defense, about armoring. We are fighting the storm, we are fighting the floods. Um, and all this language, I think, needs a paradigm shift. We should go away from against to with, to inviting water into our space, to sharing the space narrative. And the nature-based solutions I'm going to introduce you to, you to um, are doing exactly that. We just have to spread the word and the mindset of the people. So when I said we sometimes don't understand the complexity really of what coastal systems and the ocean uh, are doing for us, um, that leads me to the first term I would like to introduce. And I might preach to the choir here, but maybe there are people in the room who don't know what ecosystem services are. This is a term I'm going to repeat and um, especially when it comes to coastal systems, it's really important that for this talk and also because we are living on the coast here in Nova Scotia, uh, that we have a better understanding on what does it mean. So ecosystem services, basically um, the goods and services provided by coastal and marine ecosystems. And sadly we take them for granted because it's only now and very slowly that people are starting to put monetary values on it to make us understand what they cost actually, what money is implicated in these systems. So for example, it is stormwater management. Um, it is um, coastal systems are nurseries for commercial fish and shellfish areas. They are erosion control. They are a flood protection. They are a carbon sequestration. And then indirect, what is equally important and um, gets more and more important um, with time, the soul nourishing and health effects they have, the systems have on us, the mental and physical um, health they provide us with. I mean, who does not need a one sometimes a calm and quiet moment and finds meditation reflection on a beach walk or just sitting on the cliff and watch the ocean. Some people find that in the woods and other people find it in the ocean. So this is a service that uh, these ecosystems provide for us for free. We don't even have to pay for it. And then the next would be on my list is um, tourism, tourism, recreation. They also provide economic benefits and supports ways of life that um, in the end contribute to the social and cultural well-being of our province and maybe even an entire nation. So with this term ecosystem services introduced and the connections I made already, uh, you will find these popping up all over through this talk. Let's dive into the dark side of it. So big challenges we are facing right now and we're experiencing them already 
is climate change. You know, the heat waves we are finding now uh, ourselves in the, um, the, the fires, the, the forest fires. Uh, we have mental and physical health implications due to climate change, increasing heat, increasing disasters. Um, we have economic and social development issues. We see biodiversity loss. Um, we are losing species on a super speed. We see ecosystem degradation due to not sustainable resource extraction or ways of life or how we use our lands. Um, we see one of the challenges we are facing is disaster risk reduction in the face of what is coming. And I'm coming to that on my next slide. And then last but not least, no, food and water security are compromised and will be a big issue in the future. So this is already a whole slide full of just stuff that can bog us really down. Um, but uh, I always say I'm, I'm, I'm a half-time half -time Buddhist and I can see the challenges also as an opportunity. So take, put the head out of the sand pull the head out of the sand and um, let's try to find little bits and pieces we can work away with instead of seeing that as a huge mountain. So what is at stake? Well, if we look at erosion that is already accelerated due to the increase in, in storm and the storm force and in rain events, then I don't know if everybody knows that, but Nova Scotia is actually sinking 10 to 15 centimeters a century as a result of the last ice age. And I'm happy to explain that further if you're now wrinkling your brow and eyebrows and you don't know what to do with it, I'm happy to explain that later. Um, for Nova Scotia, the sea level rise is estimated 70 centimeters, some sources more, some sources less by the end of the century. And then we have the increase in extreme storm floods. Normally, back in the days, even when I was younger, we were talking about the, oh, this is a one in 100 year storm that, has, that is hitting us. But now that changed fairly quickly. And now we are predicting these to occur in every 10 and 20 years. And even in the past 10 years, when you look back and um, what types of storm Nova Scotia was hit, um, we can see an increase in these um, uh, extreme weather events very generally. So this is a uh, for, for some whammy that hits us. The erosion, the sinking, the sea level rise, and then the frequency that will uh, storms will hit us with. And that's things we just have to deal with it because there are multiple systems that are affected by it. And um, some of them are, for example, infrastructure, housing, the tourism sector that can be affected. Um, tourists might not want to come if the area is without beaches because they have been completely eroded away or streets are completely flooded or houses are flooded. Uh, lots of countries, island states especially, are completely dependent on tourism as their main revenue. Um, Nova Scotia is quite dependent on tourism as well, so it affects us all, you know, so it's like, it's not just, when we look at a global scale, it's not just the others that are more impacted than us. We can see lots of things happening here in Nova Scotia on our coastal area here in Canada um, fairly quickly and really fast now uh, starting to spiral. Ecosystems are degrading, as I mentioned that before, livelihoods are at threat. And then also, we also have to think of um, the cultural aspects. We have, for example, sacred places or burial grounds um, that um, where the First Nations group in, for example, and New Brunswick and PI are already affected and they have to discuss retreat now and how to salvage certain places that were uh, really relevant and important to these groups as an, as an example. So it's not just the physical, it's also the spiritual and cultural value these places uh, inherit. So the, we have a couple of solutions and prevention methods. One is coastal armoring, which I'm going to explain in a minute a, a little deeper, which is basically drawing the line 
and not to go back to my military language, not to defend against the water. The other one would be restoration, also soft solutions in, for example, beach replenishment. Then we have abstention, do nothing and just see what happens. And lastly, we have adaptation. Adaptation is to learn to live with it, to adapt to it, to the best of our knowledge and um, possibilities. So let's look into coastal armoring. As you can see here on the picture, coastal armoring can mean that there are seawalls, rock revetments, sandbags, anything that tries to prevent an area from erosion and keeps the water away from it. That can have um, quite some impacts and I would like to introduce two of the major impacts. The first one is called shoreline hardening. And if you just look at this um, picture on the upper, on the upper one, um, you can draw and you can see with the seawall, you have now separated two ecosystems. That means that whatever lives in the water cannot come out and connect to the salt marsh behind it and whatever is in the salt marsh cannot go into the water and connect with this diff with this ecosystem. Now these ecosystems have been have evolved over millions of years. If you all of a sudden separate them, then you will very likely um, cause the destruction of some of the elements in, in either of these systems. So you are killing basically what we call habitat connectivity. And that can lead to species, um, um, what is it, um, species, Oh, help me out, please. I just forgot the English word for species, degradation, um, disappearing of species. Um, we also now have a completely different wave energy because the waves were for before were able to just come up on the shore and then the energy would dissipate among the salt marsh areas. Uh, but now you have it smashing against the seawall. And that causes scouring just underneath the seawall or before the seawall. That means you will definitely lose beaches that were there, but also the whole dynamic is changing now. So these are a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. So we're losing habitat connectivity, heterogeneity, the species assemblage changes, and we have now a prevention of uh, migration of habitats course because and that's really important because even with sea level rise and what's going on ecosystems could be able to adapt themselves and adjust themselves but if we put an armoring in between then we prevent them from developing um, further or just moving further inland because that's what they would do they would just literally physically move further inland so this is the next term that um, has the same implications. Um, this is called coastal squeeze. So if we put up the seawall, we squeeze an ecosystem like this, like a salt marsh, for example, against the seawall, and that simply means we are losing it. And so the salt marsh is eroding. It cannot migrate landward due to the seawall, and we will lose the function of this ecosystem. So I hope this makes sense to you, these two uh, impacts of a simple seawall we are putting up and what it does to one or two ecosystems and um, the plethora of organisms and ecosystem functions that are connected with it. I would like to invite you, everybody who has a, text, a question maybe to ask it now before I move on in case you um, are not quite clear about anything. Larissa, can you see something? Or is everybody still? Looks like everyone's on board. Oh, cool. Awesome. OK, good. So let's have a quick peek at um, the public costs of coastal armoring. And I should say by now that coastal armoring will always be an appropriate option where natural solution can't be applied. So whatever I'm talking about of um, habitat loss and so on, there will always be places where it is an appropriate solution. And that is, for example, historical seaside areas, ocean facing town 
areas that always traditionally had a seawall that needs to be stocked up or replaced. Um, our port areas, for example, the, the, the boardwalk areas, all these areas, of course, cannot be just replaced with a natural um, system or a natural solution. So in these areas, we will always have seawalls and some sort of coastal armoring to protect our infrastructure and our properties behind that. Um, but in other areas, we should in the future just think of how can we address the problem and are there ways we can um, make it more sustainable? Public, uh, the cost of coastal armoring are quite high. Um, that is due to the urgency, for example, due to increases in storm frequency and strength, is always seen as a very quick solution. And when the public screams, oh my God, we are losing an area, or we have damage here, then the politicians of, all, of course feel urged to act and resort often to um, this as a quick fix and a quick solution. Um, there are subsidies, for example, low interest loans, there's still a disaster re relief um, funds or joint private public venture. I have a couple of examples here. The cost for armor stone, for example, that was an example from near Brunswick, I think, is four to eight dollars a ton. Um, so don't hold me responsible, it's of course changing in places. Add transportation machinery, wages, extra materials, geotextile match that often go underneath when it's well done. And uh, so 500 meter of seawall could easily cost $10 million. And now think that you have an entire town or an entire coastline, or you are a small coastal island, whatever you need to protect is absolutely unthinkable um, to have these costs occurring and being burdened on a municipality, for example. So um, these are the downsides of coastal armoring, but again, I emphasize so some sorts of coastal armoring will always be appropriate in certain areas. But it's important to know that there are uh, alternatives now that make um, total sense for different reasons I'm going to talk. So some of the ongoing issues here are actually a lack of cost regulation across the board. Some municipalities have regulation, some uses of land and coastal areas are regulated, some are not. This does not make for a protected coast. And if we are looking, for example, um, at this picture, which is a um, the supposed, uh, proposed, sorry, not supposed, proposed infilling of the Halifax Northwest Arm. I took this photo from the website that was created by Nancy Anningson back in the days before she entered the government workforce. Uh, she's now the climate specialist for HRM. Is Nancy here in the space in the room, for example, by chance? If so, then I would love to hear later from you, Nancy. Uh, anyway, so the group is called Protect the Northwest Arm, and you might have heard they did a lot of um, um, activities and advocating for um, help and change in this matter. This is the rendering that would show the infill of the Northwest Arm. Uh, it's from their website. And uh, as long as we have to deal with these things, we cannot focus on the really important things. So this is such a distraction and we should not put uh, our, all our work and force into preventing this from happening. Really don't need to deal with that. Um, happy to hear your opinions on that later too. And uh, also on top of that is that we still have a lack of provincial support for living shorelines that would be a soft solution. Uh, living shorelines is just a way of um, rethinking coastal armoring and it's li literally living shorelines with uh, plant-based and other ways of preventing erosion from happening. Talk a little bit more about the living shoreline application. I know we we there's uh, some individuals a part of the network that are involved in that type of work. Could you touch on that a little bit more? Yeah, we have actually um, um, Rosemary Lonis is one of the advocates and and, and hard worker for um, living shorelines here in our province. And there are different places where they are already developed. 
And Living Shorelines is a wonderful example of, as I said, how we can use natural materials to rebuild already eroded or areas ero uh, in danger of erosion and help them stabilize themselves over time. So we plant trees, for example, uh, to help the root network um, compound the earth and prevent from erosion from happening. Um, this can be supported by really interesting um, structures, for example, hay bales or straw bales that are also put into the ground to help um, um, collect um, and, and soil and pre um, present a ground for further uh, trees to hold root or plants in general, not just trees, plant in general. Uh, trees is not, um, trees is a bit far in the future. Um, we think smaller for the moment being. Um, these projects are just taking a couple of years longer and need a bit longer lo uh, tender love and care. Um, because it's a growing system, right? Whereas a seawall, you have the instant success and you see it. The living shorelines, as I said, just need a little bit more time until they can properly do their job. Uh, but it's definitely more sustainable in the long term because you're not interrupting habitats and you're actually creating new habitats and you are just fostering, furthering biodiversity and encouraging nature. Um, to do its job yeah sorry yeah really good explanation we do have a question right now from Denise yeah. Denise, would you like to ask your question mm -hmm. oh I think you're still muted can't seem to get on okay sorry okay. couldn't get on mute oh that's okay <laughs> happens to the best <laughs> Yeah, so I guess, so I typed my question in there. Um, so really, like an infilling project such as this would obviously be affecting the land below the ocean, like in the Northwest Arm, which is crown owned, right? Everything below the low tide mark is crown owned. So don't they have to have a permit and address all the environmental impacts of doing that infilling when they want to do that type of project? You know, I'm not sure how much they have to present. Um, there is some interesting system in place that I still not really familiar with um, that allows the owner of the land, I think it's one of these really old, old laws, maybe somebody here in the, in the room knows even more about it than I, um, it, it, I, I it's something I, I easily always forget when somebody explains it to me, um, that allows you to extend your land, basically what you own, beyond the waterline for a certain amount of meters. That's an ancient, mm -hmm. ancient thing. And that's why they are allowed to do it. I do not know, so the environmental assessment would be something else, would be a different category. Um, but, um, it's definitely one of the issues I have is not just the environmental, but it's also we're just creating unnecessary risks that need to be taken care of in the future. You know, if there is a house on it, um, they can request, of course, emergency services in case of a storm flood. There's people, there are people that need to be evacuated. There will be sewage that needs to be taken care of in case something is destroyed. Um, by erosion, by wind, by storm, by floods, flood waves, and so on and so on. Especially when we think of sea level rise, rise um, and uh, and our sinking and the increase in in, in extreme events. Mm -hmm. So I just think this might be working for the next 25, 50 years, maybe even longer. But at one point, point it will become a liability. And I mm -hmm. think we just now have to think more forward into the future and not just short term for short term gain and pleasure. Yeah, speaking of erosion, um, John in the chat mentioned that um, a living shoreline may reduce erosion, but erosion will continue depending on the natural wave action. Yes. Um, someone also mentioned that this week the Irving Shipyard announced that they want to infill an area in the harbor. Yeah, yeah, I also heard that they wanted to infill uh, in Dartmouth here with, with several millions of um, pounds of quarry leftovers or whatever. 
Oh yeah. Um, that yeah. So uh, there's nothing you can say about that. Um, it's just it just make me shake my head, you know, like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Matt, did you have anything you wanted to contribute on this topic? Um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I was also going to yeah mention that uh, I was just down near the old uh, dump there um, near the Bedford Basin where they're currently still doing a big infill. Uh, I used to work for the city where we would go there to do our dumping about five years ago. And so I saw when they first started that project, I would see the, the big backhoe right on the edge, just going back and forth, back and forth, filling it in. Now, five years later, they're all the way out. It's crazy long. Um, yeah. And yeah, like if you drive across either of the bridges, you just see all of that is just, I assume it's already all infilled. Um, so I'd be interested to hear further into the presentation um, about maybe converting some of these hardened areas um, back into um, living shorelines. If uh, <laughs> like any, anything going on. Uh, <laughs> I have that, but... No solution for that. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we are eradicated from the planet, then it will convert back into something. <laughs> it was before it's like the empire strikes back and nature is reclaiming. I hope so, so. Uh, yeah. Um, I will also add that uh, I believe the Ecology Action Center, along with a couple of orga other organizations, including uh, Helping Nature Heal, um, did a little living shoreline demonstration site on the arm at the St. Mary's Boat Club a um, few yes. years back, if anyone's exactly. aware of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like There's one St. Mary's Boat Club. Yeah, thank you for reminding me of that one. If somebody has wants to have a look around. And also, if you want to check out Rosemarie Lohne's uh, website, um, she's a professional and she works in the establishment of uh, living shorelines and yes erosion will always happen to an account and uh, it will be an, an ongoing process to um, help our coastlines to help themselves stabilize in whatever way is possible. So with regard to the um, lack of cost regulation I hope that most of you in this space might know it but uh, actually when it comes to policy making we don't need to reinvent the wheel we can push for better laws and regulation we have great minds in this province that are working uh, to push for policy responses and one result is the what we soon have may i proudly present you the nova scotia coastal protection act so i'm really excited about this piece of legislation um and uh, what it will do is hopefully regulate, um, provide protection for vital ecosystems and uh, eliminate inappropriate coastal development to protect people and places. So I hope that's the regulation that's coming soon. They're right now just working on filling loopholes and um, working on the little nitty gritty details. So that's something very positive. And uh, with that, I would like to lead over to the nature-based solution. The nature-based solution, they increase the resilience of coastal communities. And I'm explaining in my examples how that's happening. Um, they address all the issues pointed out earlier, like food security, health, mental and physical, and so on and so on. And they provide benefits on an environmental, social and economic level. And I'm diving right in into the first one, which is the protection and restoration of coastal ecosystems. And one of them, as uh, we have already talked about, the soft solution, um, like um, the um, shoreline stabilization. And another example I would like to show you, which is really relevant for many countries um, in, the, in the south around the globe, is a mangrove. Because we see mangrove, we're losing mangroves in, in, in a, quite some speed. They make space to resorts, hotels, to marinas for tourists and yachts. Um, they are overused and make space for for example, shrimp farming, aquaculture, and so on. But what they do is a fantastic phenomenal ecosystem service. They are the best flood protection because if you just look at this picture and you see a storm flood, 
they are going into these mangroves and of course they will dissipate the wave energy and the community living behind these mangroves will likely be not hit and if they're hit then definitely not with the same strengths as if this mangrove wouldn't be there. So um, high biodiversity, they have a high cultural significance. They are used by the um, um, local people for building material. They're used in a sustainable way, um, mostly. Um, they are used for medicine, some plants are medicinal uh, contents. They're used for food and they're nurseries for um, fish and shellfish and uh, other critters that can be used by these coastal communities. So coastal communities are, that are in, in an original traditional way lived within these mangroves or behind these mangroves, with the mangroves, I should say, are uh, fairly resilient communities when it comes to climate change and uh, if they have intact mangrove systems. And that's why it's important that mangroves are being replanted and reforested, which is happening in many places and as initiatives from the communities themselves, which is quite nice. Um, and mangroves are growing fairly quickly and can very easily be planted. And another example I would like to give you now for protection restoration is right on our doorstep, which is the Living Shoreline Project Mahone Bay. I don't know if you heard about it. If you go to the website, you can read a lot more about what I'm going to present here for the shortage of time. Um, but they are um, along, along their waterline, uh, their coastline, they are building a combination of components, which is a rock sill. So this would be a part of hard armoring, yes, but there are openings in the sites they, uh, who would let in um, the water and this creates a tidal wetland. And then at the very end, towards the parking lot, you can just see blurry here, um, and towards the infrastructure, existing infrastructure would be a vegetated bank. So this triple system is now installed and uh, will on, on a quite large scale actually is a great project and they're looking for volunteers if you're interested and you want to help um, building these or you want to just go check out and go to Mahone Bay or check out their website. So this is an example for coastland uh, coastal protection and restoration. And I would like to go to the next one if there's no question in the room right now. No, nope, we're all good. I did put the, so. the yeah. Mahone Living Shoreline just in the chat if anyone has any more questions yeah. they want to answer. Yeah. Yeah. The second um, nature based solution would be the protection, restoration, and sustainable use of forest landscapes. Um, because our coasts are not a um, cut-off system from forests in the hinterland, so to say. Uh, what happens in the woods behind us is not staying in the woods. So if we talk about, for example, non-sustainable um, clear-cutting that leads to erosion, this erosion is affecting the rivers, the streams, and it's ending up in our coastal areas and um, impacts all the waterways in, in different ways and the loss of the um, uh, fertile crumb layer, of course, uh, soil layer. So if we have intact forests, uh, forest landscapes, we have a secured water supply. We have an erosion control and erosion risk reduction naturally we have a high biodiversity, they are carbon sinks, and they also have cultural significance. So an example for um, forest landscapes restoration is the, the only one I don't have an example for. So if you don't mind, I just move on to the number three, which is the protection and restoration and management of wetlands. Wetlands are really important for our coastal systems because they provide water storage. They are a flood protection. And if you don't, if you cannot imagine how what wetlands can be flood protection, is it think of them as a sponge. So whenever we have a flood, these wetlands can literally soak up quite a bit before the water would move further on and flood um, 
um, existing infrastructure behind. They have a natural filter protection. So whatever comes from land, for example, before it goes into the ocean, it's filtered in the wetlands. And of course, they are providing in many countries, um, providing food. Um, lots of coastal folks, um, peoples around the world are dependent on fishery direct from the wetlands and other plants they are harvesting from it. So I have an example for the restoration of wetlands, which is ex actually uh, also um, in our province, well in New Brunswick, but it's also happening in our province. It's, uh, this is Danica from Prosti, maybe you have heard the name. She's a professor um, in, uh, at St. Mary's University and she is engaged in fantastic projects about getting rid of dikes um, and restoring salt marshes. So rather than building dikes higher to keep the sea at bay, which would be a real problem for provinces such as New Brunswick, because it's very expensive and the dikes were built with the, by the Acadians. So maintenance is going to be more and more expensive and building up is also going to be a challenge. So instead of that, um, these um, researchers are letting the water flow through. There's also fantastic examples from the UK where that is happening. Um, also, because of increased erosion along the dikes, it, it's, it, it got more and more costly to prevent uh, these or to find methods from preventing the dikes from erosion. So um, making room for wetlands is one way to uh, help with, um, with the floods and the future floods coming too. We just need to find, of course, land that can be flooded behind. This is a bit of a challenge because often it's, uh, uh, it's land that belongs to farmers and it's um, used land. Um, so there's a, it's a long process of communication and consultation with farmers and other stakeholders of course, the entire community needs to be on board with projects like this. Um, on the other hand, we can create new wetlands that attract tourists and attract more biodiversity and uh, interesting animals. And it would be interesting to visit these places and turn them into a tourist destination or just um, for us for recreational reasons. Um, this here is a salt marsh near Windsor here in Nova Scotia. And uh, uh, so it's not an, uh, while it was not an intentional salt marsh restoration, she said that the, it demonstrates the capacity of salt marshes to establish themselves in coastal environments. So this is a, a, one of these awesome projects and I really like the idea of opening dikes whenever we can, of course, and um, wherever the province is able to either buy the land or acquire it in whatever way is possible. So anybody has a question about that or a comment or would like to add something? If not, I'm moving, moving on. Okay, then let's move on to solution number four would be providing spaces for rivers to naturally flow. Because that's something we see increasingly happening that rivers um, experience these flash floods or early ice melts uh, ice jam and uh, we see damage happening um, through uh, riverine flooding. So if we let the rivers flow in their old conditions as they were or restore them back to the states in areas of course where it's possible, um, then we have a natural flood risk protection but also water security. And I have an example for you for that. This is an example um, that's called peeling back the pavement and especially in cities, making space for, um, for, uh, for water. And the story behind that is that cities over centuries, decades and centuries, have paved over all small little rivers and um, creeks and whatever water was flowing naturally through our landscape to make space for development. And the water, of course, has to go somewhere. So often we build 
culverts and put the culverts under the streets and under the houses and down deep in the earth. Um, but uh, that didn't help with the ongoing flooding issues we are now seeing in cities where we have water coming from rivers, um, from flash floods, from rain down the streets and it's going into our houses. So another opportunity here is literally peeling back the pavement. Uh, it's a rainwater management initiative. Um, this is a report uh, from a handbook. The handbook is called Peeling Back the Pavement and it's written by uh, Susan Porterbop. It's uh, a Canadian initiative. And I can pro pro provide the link if somebody is interested or you Google it yourself if you want to. And on the second uh, picture, this one, hang on, oops. This is in Dartmouth, and it's also called daylighting. I live in Dartmouth, this is quite close to my house. I, I'm very happy to see this initiative where a river has been literally uncovered and unpaved and given space. And uh, this way it has a natural flood protection because the water, now the river can take on more water and it's not, um, going flash flood from the streets and roads uh, into the houses or basements of people. So daylighting a river, it's also helping um, with biodiversity, biodiversity because now there are fishes again using these fish ladders, as you can see, and there's a connectivity between the water bodies. This here is connected to um, Sullivan's Pond and then Sullivan's Pond is connected to Lake Banook and so on and so on. So I think that's a, quite a, a great example for a nature-based solution, giving space to waters in our cities. Um, this is, by the way, the Sawmill River Daylighting Project, if you're interested in it. Any questions about that? If not, I'm moving on. Okay, don't hear anything. So number five, I have six examples, by the way. So this is the second to last, agroforestry systems and sustainable agriculture. Um, we need to rethink the way we're doing agriculture. And I think that's pretty clear to everybody by now. And uh, one solution would be going back to agroforestry systems. There are examples for Canada, but I am fixated with another example from Africa I would like to present to you. It's absolutely important to secure food security for communities that are living in the area and can benefit from these models. They provide the water regulation, um, they keep water and uh, instead of monocultures. Yeah, exactly. If you compare that to monocultures, we have to go away from these models, especially in, in global south countries that are planting monocultures of coffee or cocoa and so on. These countries are losing so much of the fertile earth, they need to use a lot of fertilizer, they have to use a lot of water because uh, the earth is drying out far too quickly. And um, lots of um, models are now swimming, swiveling around, pivoting around and using the agri uh, culture, sorry, agroforestry system as an example. And what it looks like, what it could look like like this is um, presented here on my next slide, which is not moving, come on. Okay, my slideshow is not moving. Lars, am I still online? Yeah, it looks good. It's just still on slide number five. You're correct. Yeah. Um, okay, I wonder just what, what happened here. Something is stuck. Oh yeah, okay. Well, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. So this example is Community Forest International, which is a small NGO in New Brunswick. And I worked a lot with them during my days in Sequel at Mount Ellison. So I, I'm quite familiar with what they were doing, what they were doing back in the days. And that was helping the community of Pemba, which is a small island of, of Zanzibar, off the coast of Zanzibar, to help themselves basically. And the idea was to create a spice forest, which turned into a farmer-led cooperative and they were transitioning away from monoculture and the um, destructive um, methods, um, practice of slash and burn and uh, or planting monoculture. Yeah. Um, with the 
effect of having a carbon capture, having food security, providing jobs and money, uh, high value products for this entire community. So they're growing vanilla and cinnamon and several other spices within a forest. And um, they have a great success with this initiative. And there was a great economic growth for these small local communities that are benefiting from this project. So this is a, um, an idea about how agriculture can be conducted in a different way. And this is an example for spices, but of course you can grow fruits and coffee and cocoa together in, under different canopy heights and under different constellations just together, which has so many benefits for the soil, for the biodiversity and so on and so on. Mm. So agroforestry, definitely one of the nature-based solution. Okay, and then lastly, I would like to present you with number six, which is urban green and blue spaces. And that's really crucial because um, of the heat island effect, for example. The heat island effect is that we have too much concrete in our cities. This concrete is radiating back the heat and is creating the issues we're seeing. I mean, we all know about the numbers in inner cities of Toronto, for example, of people who are uh, in hospital with heat shocks. So larger cities and lots of concrete are not a good combination um, and, and, and habitat for, for humans to survive and thrive in. And of course, um, it's not just heat stroke, it's all the heat related infections, uh, illnesses that are going hand in hand with that. So if we create more urban green and blue spaces, uh, green roofs, green walls, and um, uh, water systems that will definitely help improve human health and well-being, help with social development, uh, attracting people to this space, and creating green jobs as well. I have a couple of examples for you. The first one is part of a presentation I have about New Orleans, and there are lots of slides, but I picked just this one. So New Orleans, after Katrina is rethinking um, of how they model the streets and the houses and the, the living spaces. So they now um, pre pre provide, uh, are thinking of building spaces, which much more green space that is also able to capture stormwater and flood water as well. And um, that's, so the green space is using, um, it, it's cooling, but it's also functioning as a sponge and water can also be collected as you can see in this type of systems uh, underneath the porous asphalt. So the asphalt is no longer a just um, impermeable, impermeable surface. It's a porous surface and lets water go through. So there are different ways we can prevent water from getting into uh, people's homes or um, damage infrastructure in other ways. And the second example I have for you is from, this is a picture from China actually. Um, it's called Sponge Cities. And that's tackling multiple issues with one solution. So making space for water again, creating these green spaces. Um, it's helping with the sinking water tables in urban areas, which is a, a global issue as well, because we're extracting more water than we use. And so we not only have not enough water, but these cities are also sinking. Um, polluted water uh, discharged is uh, not just discharged into rivers and ocean, but it's just filtered through these water systems first. And it helps with the degradation of urban ecosystems. Uh, it's creating green areas. It's attracting um, different types of, of insects and birds to live in these places. Uh, and uh, of course, it helps no, to alleviate the uh, intensity and frequency of urban flooding. Uh, by capturing this type of water. And it's a refuge, it's uh, a recreational space and, and invites you to just sit and have a quiet moment. So it definitely also ticks the box for mental health if you're living in a larger inner city and you don't have the opportunities to leave these concrete spaces. Then you have a green blue oasis. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, no, um, green roofs is another uh, definitely 
uh, something that's going to happen. And to my knowledge, there is a, um, a regulation that says that in the future, every new building uh, has to reconsider uh, implementing a green roof. These things are really important because we see a growing coastal population scenario. Uh, global population will have grown to 11.3 billion people by 2060. People are flocking towards the coast for different reasons. That's for retirement. But in many places, these bigger cities are growing because they are also industrial hubs. And many places are attracted to them uh, for the promise of um, better life, higher wages, and so on and so on. So many people will live in this, what we call the low elevation coastal zone uh, around the globe. And it's absolutely crucial that we th start thinking about how in urban context can we prevent um, disaster from happening and protecting people. Um, and of course, no, most people, most of these countries are uh, those that have contributed the least to climate change. I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Any question? Because I'm otherwise I'm just going over, move over to the nutshell. So just a couple of slides left. The natural is we can bring diverse natural features and processes into cities, into landscapes, and into seascapes. Um, Nature-based solutions can provide long-term environmental, social, and economic benefits, as we've seen. They counteract degradation. They maintain and create ecosystem service integrity. They can create jobs, improve economic situations for individuals as well as communities. And in the long term, they are actually cost saving, although they might be upfront or appear upfront uh, more expensive. So some other things we can do to incre increase community resilience, because um, we want a thriving community in the future. So on the constitutional and community level, we have to make use of the scientific data that's available. All the data is out there. We just need people that help us now to translate it into something that politicians can use and that communities can use and understand for their own purposes so that they can communicate among each other the needs and the next step and priorities and so on. Uh, for example, flood risk mapping, there are fantastic data out here in our province about um, how our sea level rise will look like, how what areas will be affected by flooding and so on. We can screen population for mental and physical health impacts. We can have a needs assessment within our communities. We can um, prioritize, we can um, identify low hanging fruit and smaller projects. We can update emergency plans and the resources and make these resources accessible, especially I always remind of newcomers, for example, and communities that are um, um, whatever, whatever minority groups or uh, impaired groups. Uh, we can identify high risk population. We have to include first responders and other stakeholders and at every step include the community in the process, absolutely. And it's, um, this is because we need to think about thriving versus surviving. And that's the difference between adaptation versus mitigation. Adaptation is adapting to what will come in the future, looking forward versus mitigation, which is basically fixing. Fixing what's broken, or fixing what needs to be fixed right way right now, but uh, we have to create thriving communities and not just surviving communities. We don't want to lag behind and we don't want to increase vulnerability. And right now um, I, I'm seeing in Nova Scotia lots of fantastic groups and initiatives that are doing exactly that. They are um, advocating for all these um, issues that I've that I've raised here. So for functioning healthy coastal ecosystem, for diversified livelihoods, for human health and safety and so on. That all makes adaptation. And then last but not least is um, what can you do? 
Organize events to raise awareness, look out for local events and workshops, add your voice to the call for coastal legislation and meet with your MLAs. MLAs actually like to be called uh, and be pestered. <laughs> so give them a call, find their phone number, send emails. Help create pressure on issues. Um, for example, if you remember here in our province, a good example is Megan Leslie's bill prohibiting plastic beads entering waterways. That was through in, uh, in a number of very short years um, with the help of the population, um, writing petitions, writing emails, putting pressure on the system. And all of a sudden gone were the plastic beads that are no longer in our waterways. Engage with initiatives and groups, NGOs, become an activist, an advocate, and always, always make sure that nobody is left behind. And don't see it as a huge work, Sisyphus work, as a huge mountain in front of you. Just look at what can you do. And even if it's just a tiny little nugget, a tiny little bit, choose your choose your area, what you would like to do, and just start working on it. You know, you're not alone with that. So we are a whole province and we are a whole globe. <laughs> a whole world is working on it now. Thank you much for your attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Georgia, for providing such an amazing PowerPoint. I appreciate the work that you put into this. Oh, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have I'm any questions? I'm stop share now. Mm -hmm. Ugh. doesn't let me stop share mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there anything you can do there you go okay yeah there you go excellent um denise did you have a question yes so georgia you mentioned that um scientific data i attended a presentation back in my work life um, that was actually in sh the insurance companies starting mm -hmm. to look at the cost of repairing and it was forest fires and floods, which are yes. becoming more frequent. And I wonder if that's something like when we talk about scientific evidence, there's also like talking real dollars and cents. And yes. this idea about, is there a way to help particularly municipalities you know, caught, make it more life cycle costing and make it more beneficial to say, we're going to do adaptive versus build them higher or, or re, rebuild them to resist higher sea levels. Uh, well, so one thing that instantly comes to mind is that uh, every politician is only voted in for a number of years. And it's very unpopular if you start uh, with talking about climate change and adaptation in general right now. <laughs> and if you talk about the costs um, that will occur for a long term project, because um, people are instantly screaming about tax money and there are still too many deniers and they don't like the idea. And the politicians want to be reelected. But that aside, I think that we have right now really fabulous people in HRM that are working on exactly that. And they are in the government position and they are working on um, Halifax, for example, or the group that's working for Halifax in 2020. Uh, sorry, 2020. <laughs> it's past. <laughs> 2050 uh, and so on. So there are lots of public consultation happening, lots of workshop with stakeholders. I think we are on a really good path to it, I feel. Does it answer your question, Denise? Awesome, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up? Awesome. So just so everyone knows, um, in the chat, we have dropped our newsletter link. If anyone wants to stay connected with the Nova Scotia Environmental Network, a lot of the solutions that have been talked about here tonight are things that our member organizations are happily put on. Um, also in the chat, you can check out becoming a member for the Nova Scotia Environmental Network. We let individuals as well as organizations join. Um, and there's also a link to our Climate Change Caucus where you can learn more and join the caucus today to help work on the issues in our province. Um, yes. And Jordan, one last question was just asked. Um, mm -hmm. And they were wondering, when was Bill 106 scheduled to be voted on? 
Oh, I have no idea, to be honest. The last okay. time I checked when I prepared the lecture for my winter class, mm -hmm. and they were not yet ready. They were still working on the on the fine print, on the small bits and pieces and mm -hmm. prevent loopholes. Well, yes, I agree with that. That's, that's as up to date as I am as well. <laughs> Um, well, I want to thank you very much, Georgia, for coming um, and everyone else who joined our conversation today. Um, the issues don't get fixed overnight. Nothing happens super fast. No. But conversations like this are an awesome start. It's a great way to involve the public yeah. in decision making um, and just keep everyone informed on what's going on in your province. Yeah. And we have fantastic solutions that mm -hmm. are already partly applied in this province. I'm, I'm very positive. Mm -hmm. so. The class is more than half full. <laughs> 100%. Uh, this presentation has been recorded. It will be posted on our website, which is just nsenvironmentalnetwork.com. All of our social media is also NS Environmental Network. Please check us out. Um, see if you can get involved in any way. We always appreciate hearing from our members. And thank you very much, Georgia. It was a lovely, oh, lovely so tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Talk soon. Yes, absolutely.